Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Kim McCarl, Communications Officer with Contra Costa Health Services, and Dr. Chris Farnatano is here today to take some of your questions. Um, we thank you for doing that, Dr. Farnatano. Um, in order to maintain a little distance between the doctor and myself, I'm off camera, so you won't see me, but you will hear my voice as I, as I go through these questions. We did get a good number of questions from you, so we're going to do as many from the public. So we'll do as many as we can um, in the half an hour that we have allotted, and then we'll find another time next week to do it again. So we appreciate you always being willing to do that. We have about four uh, categories of questions that we'll go through today. Uh, we want to start a little bit with around the questions around pace of opening. We'll talk a little bit about testing, what activities are allowed, which ones are not, and why and why not. And then um, we have kind of a catch-all category at the end. So that's kind of how we'll make our way through this uh, today. So I wanted to start a little bit about um, some misperception that there might be in the community around what happens on May 31st. So we, can we talk a little bit about the two orders and how they work together and how they don't work together? Yes, and so uh, the local health orders, we uh, started back in the middle of uh, March. Um, initially had an end date, and that end date uh, was really to kind of signal that we were going to reevaluate those orders um, uh, on a uh, short-term time period basis. Um, uh, and we have evaluated those after several weeks, and we've made changes to those, and recently we've, we've loosened up some of those restrictions. Um, but some of the public uh, um, took that end date to think that when the end date came, we'd suddenly open up everything and the order would go away and we'd be back to our kind of pre-COVID uh, um, life. Um, and that was never the intention. So so as with the state order, which does not have an end date, the, the current local order does not have an end date. Uh, having said that, we're still committed to reevaluating this uh, every few weeks and um, making sure that um, you know, we're looking at the data on a daily basis and making adjustments and seeing where we can open up activities as the, the data and the, the epidemic allows. So why are we not reopening as quickly as our neighbors, even though our indicators appear to be better than some of our neighbors? Well, one thing about uh, pandemics uh, and viruses that spread uh, like this one, this coronavirus or COVID-19, is they tend to spread much more in densely populated areas. They, they spread from people to people. Um, the virus doesn't have legs. It relies on people to spread them. And we've seen like in places like New York City and Miami uh, and in Chicago that the denser populated areas are much higher risk for outbreaks and surges of cases to occur. And so rural areas that have low uh, numbers of cases and the population is just much more spread out, they um, can safely open up things at a faster pace than denser areas like Los Angeles and the Bay Area can. So attestation, what is that and how does that apply to us versus more rural communities? So when the state uh, created this attestation process, it really uh, was thinking in terms of three different groups of counties. There's the very rural counties with very few or no cases and a very spread out um, low population density, um, like in the far, far north of California, that um, could be allowed to go faster than the state order and its, the state's plan to reopen. And then there's another group of counties that are going to be uh, opening up at the same pace and on the same schedule as the state. And the third group is these, these group of uh, more highly populated counties, especially the, the, the densely populated counties in the Bay Area, like Contra Costa County, and, and the, the Southern California counties. And those, uh, because they are at higher risk, they have higher numbers, need to move at a slightly slower pace than what the state is to prevent another surge of cases. So it can sort of feel like we're being penalized because of our proximity to counties with uh, worse indicators. Are we being penalized? Well, the, the county of Contra Costa is not an island. We, we don't exist uh, outside of our neighbors. And so many people who live in Contra Costa County work, shop, um, drive to other counties, uh, drive to Oakland, uh, work in San Francisco. Um, and so the, what happens to those counties 
uh, affects Contra Costa County, and what happens in Contra Costa County affects those counties. And that's why the Bay Area health officers have been working together to try to coordinate our efforts so we march at, at a similar pace uh, in, a, in a careful, deliberate reopening of the economy um, so that we don't go too quickly and lead to a, a surge of cases because no one wants to go back and, and shut things down again because we've had a surge that is leading to more deaths and our hospitals being overwhelmed. So are we now in phase two? So the, the state has uh, created these concepts of phases. Phase one is where we were with, with a, a more strict shelter in place or stay at home orders. And then phase two, phase three, and then phase four is a, a real, a full opening of our uh, economy. Uh, but even with phase four, things are gonna be different. Um, there, there are things like uh, enhanced hand hygiene with hand washing and um, hand sanitizer, social distancing, face coverings when you're out in, in public, uh, a, a real culture of not going to work when you have a cough or a sniffles or, or any kind of symptoms. Those things will probably be with us even in phase four. Um, but the, the state created these steps of phases. So um, the state moved into early phase two on uh, May 9th. Uh, Contra Costa County moved into that same level of early phase two 11 days later. Um, so the state is now moving in deeper into phase two um, over the last few days, um, but it's still not quite into phase three, um, where we are uh, evaluating where we are right now, currently in early phase two, and considering uh, further moves if the, the numbers and the, the data suggest we can do that safely. So in phase two, what are the minimum requirements that a business must enforce and what happens if the business doesn't comply? So there's different requirements um, for different businesses. All businesses are required to have a social distancing plan and there's a template for that plan that is um, a part of our health order and is found on our website cchealth.org slash forward slash coronavirus. Um, that social distancing plan includes uh, making sure customers can stay six feet apart, that, that employees and customers are wearing face coverings, um, that there's uh, hand hygiene available, all those kind of steps so that businesses can reduce the risk of being a source of spread of this virus between employees, between uh, um, customers and, and the public. So we've talked a lot about the five indicators, and, and I know we have a lot of people visit our, our dashboard on our website to look at the progress we're making towards indicators, but how do those really help you understand criteria for moving into the next phase? How are you using those and the science behind those to make decisions about moving forward? We, we in the Bay Area have one of the first in the nation shelter-in-place orders, and that was very effective because of the cooperation of the entire public, all the residents really following this very strict uh, stay at home order. Uh, we were able to uh, prevent a serious surge, uh, we flattened the curve, we brought the numbers down. Um, now we have to figure out how we go back to a more normal uh, kind of life with opening up activities, opening up businesses, uh, without having a surge, because no one wants to stay in that strict uh, shelter in place uh, forever. So those indicators are telling us that we are opening up carefully and slowly, and we are doing it successfully. So we're not overwhelming our hospitals. We're not seeing a surge in cases. Our hospitals are well prepared for any small surges that do happen with enough um, personal protective equipment that we can protect those healthcare workers who are on the front lines every day and we can say to them, we've got your back and we're not, we're not putting you and your families at risk. Um, we've got the equipment that's going to keep you safe. Um, and then we have the infrastructure to really identify new cases and, and that's through lots of testing. And by testing, we can identify cases so people know to isolate and quarantine. So this is a really a targeted shelter in place. We want to target those folks who um, test positive or are exposed to someone who tested positive so they can uh, um, stay at home 
stay away from work, stay away from the supermarket or the retail store while they're potentially infectious. Um, and that means a whole team of contact tracers who can um, reach out to all those people who test positive, identify who their close contacts are, make sure they know what they, they need to do to stop the spread. So if we can do this kind of targeted shelter in place, we can allow the rest of the uh, economy, the rest of the society to open back up in a safe way. So this is probably one of the most common questions we get and one of the hardest to answer, and that is when do we anticipate opening back up? So when is a really hard question because the virus doesn't operate on any fixed schedule. We really need to look at the data, and we are looking at the data on a daily basis. Uh, we know that it can take two weeks for someone to get an exposure and then develop symptoms. Uh, can take longer before they come in and get a test, get those test results back. We also know it can take um, a, about a week from the time someone first gets symptoms to the time they get sick enough to be in the hospital. So our hospital numbers um, are really a late indicator. It takes a while before uh, a spread in our, our population really leads to a change in the hospital numbers. So we've been saying we need uh, several weeks, at least, a, at least two weeks, before we make a big change, uh, before we can safely say it's safe to make another big change and, and, and another opening. So on May 4th, we opened up to uh, all construction and uh, all outdoor businesses and a lot of outdoor recreation. And we waited two weeks and looked at the data. And after two weeks, we saw that our numbers were staying flat, our hospital uh, cases were staying flat. Um, we were making progress on getting enough PPE, although we're still not there yet. We're making progress on getting more tests done and getting more case investigators done, although we're not where we want to be yet. But because of that progress, after two weeks, we made a, another change. We opened up to curbside retail. We opened up to manufacturing, warehousing, and logistics. And so we're going to continue that approach. Um, we're going to be not necessarily going as fast as the state. We're going to let the data drive our changes. Um, and we're going to give a couple weeks between a big change before we make another big change. Why does quarantining healthy, low-risk people make sense? Shouldn't we just quarantine older adults and people with health conditions? Uh, the problem with um, quarantining just the high-risk people is those high-risk people can't be 100% quarantined. They can't be completely sealed out from society. For example, um, someone who lives in an assisted living facility or a nursing home, there are staff there that are, that are bringing them meals. There's staff there that may be doing personal care for them. Um, those staff have to live in the world. They have to go to the supermarket. They have to um, you know, do shopping. They're coming home to their family members. Um, so if those folks and their families and the other people they have contact are picking up cases, then they're bringing them, they're exposing them to the, the elderly. If we have a, a child that picks up a case at school, we know that most children uh, don't get very severe illness, but that child could bring it to their grandparent, uh, could bring it to their, their mother or father who has heart failure or who has diabetes or some other chronic condition that puts them at risk. So because we can't seal off um, the high-risk population from the rest of the population completely, we need everyone to take the steps to reduce the spread um, to, to protect all of us. Dr. Sarah Cody in Santa Clara County expressed concerns about the state moving so fast toward reopening. Do you have similar concerns? Is it problematic for the state and Bay Area to be moving at such different paces? I do have some concerns on how quickly the state is moving. If you look at the statewide numbers, you can see that the cases, daily cases in California are uh, on the upward trend. Uh, deaths in California are still flat or even trending slightly upward. And hospitalizations across California haven't really dropped very significantly in the last few weeks. You can look at uh, many areas of the state um, where, where cases are, are really spiking. Um, so. We in the Bay Area, Dr. Cody, myself, uh, the other health officers in the, in the, the, the large uh, counties in the Bay Area 
are really trying to work together and take a scientific approach, let the data drive the decision making, and, and not um, go too quickly before we can see the effect of one change uh, before making another change, because it's going to be a lot harder to pull back than it is to move forward if we go too quickly and we see a, a big surge in cases. And remember, those surges in cases, not only do they overwhelm the hospitals, but that they mean additional unnecessary deaths in our population. So you talked a little bit about testing, but I want to talk a little more specifically about that topic because I think it's an important one. And frankly, it's one where our community can be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, should I get tested? Yes, you should, Kim. And I recommend that everybody get tested. I myself got tested uh, last week and um, really encourage everyone in our community to get tested. And the reason is we don't know everywhere where this virus is hiding. We are learning more and more about how asymptomatic individuals are a big driver of spread of this virus. In fact, um, some studies suggest that the time that people are most contagious is in the 24 hours before they get symptoms. And there's some people who never get symptoms but still spread the virus. And, and the person they spread it to could potentially get very sick or even die. And so that's why we need everyone to get tested. We, we were testing about 400 tests a day uh, a couple weeks ago. Now we're testing over 800 tests a day. So we've doubled the amount of testing in two weeks, but we still we want to get up to about 2,200 tests a day. And that's the level we think, uh, if we get to that level, we'll, we'll be able to really identify most cases of COVID in the community so those people can know to isolate themselves, to separate themselves temporarily until they're no longer infectious. And we can really keep the numbers down to a very low number um, and continue to open up our society. Did it hurt when you got tested? It didn't hurt, but it was uncomfortable. And, um, you know, the test I had uh, was, was a deep nasal swab, um, and it was performed at, at one of our uh, test sites that we have open for anyone in the community who wants to get a test site, symptoms or no symptoms. Um, we are actually, uh, a lot of sites are now moving to uh, a more comfortable way of testing. It, it's not a deep nasal swab, but it's, it's a more superficial nasal swab. It doesn't go as deep in the nose, uh, and it's much more comfortable. And some sites are even allowing uh, uh, the individual to collect their own swab rather than have a, a nurse or a doctor uh, do the swab. So the test is getting easier to do. It's getting less uncomfortable. Um, but even, even my test, uh, you know, it was, it was 10 or 15 seconds, um, a little uncomfortable, but not painful. And, you know, I was in that testing center and out in 10 minutes. Um, so it was a real, real quick procedure. And I would just also say that our call line to schedule your test has a wait of about six minutes right now. So there was some, some problem with hold times when we first started, but that has been resolved. Um, and so we're waiting for people to call and schedule their appointments. Yeah, and, and we also, the, the state, state test sites have an online where you can schedule them online. I, I did that, and it was, took me 10 minutes to create my little username and password and have my pick of different appointment times. Um, so you can do it online, you can do our you can call and um, very short wait to get to get an appointment and we've got appointments available for anyone who wants one. So somebody in the chat section just asked a very good question which is how often should somebody get tested? Well we are recommending that people who um, at higher risk get tested on a, at least a monthly basis and so so who's at higher risk? Well we think about healthcare workers, um, uh, first responders like firefighters and police officers, um, we think about folks who, who live around or care for the vulnerable elderly, like the nursing home workers, the assisted living facility workers. But we also uh, consider in higher risk categories those folks who are um, have a lot of contact with the public. So, so the retail worker, the, the, the checker at Safeway, um, the folks who are um, working in those essential or allowed businesses who are, have a lot of contact with the public. Even though you may be covering your face, you may be doing great high end hygiene, um, you may be uh, trying to stay six feet apart when possible from customers. Um, all those things reduce the risk, but they don't eliminate it. And so we do encourage 
folks who are in those kind of high contact type of work to really get tested uh, on a regular basis, at least monthly. So we talked about this a little last time, but let's talk about it again. Uh, antibody testing. Are we doing systemic antibody testing? Are we giving antibody plasma treatment for high risk? Are we recommending antibody testing? So currently, um, the, the main experts in the field, including the Infectious Disease Society of, of America, which is a, a leading group of infectious disease physicians, um, are only recommending antibody testing in the setting of some kind of a research study um, to look at the prevalence of um, antibodies across the uh, community uh, and not for an individual's use because um, they're not that accurate yet enough um, to really tell us um, for sure whether you have antibodies on an individual person. So. For example, a test that is 95% uh, accurate uh, when it has a positive test um, sounds, um, sounds really accurate, but when you have a population where there's 5% or less of the population that has um, actual antibodies, if you run that test um, uh, around 100 people, you'd actually find that um, you get about five or ten tests that are positive, um, and only five or six of those tests are really actually people who have antibodies, and the other four or five people um, are what we would call false positives. The test says they have antibodies, but they actually don't. Um, and so a lot of the tests out there on the market have that level of accuracy, which uh, isn't really enough to tell you, yes, you have antibodies, or no, you don't. We really need, are waiting for tests that are even more, like 99.9% .9 accurate, um, to, to, to be helpful. And then besides whether uh, knowing whether the test is accurate and telling you if you have antibodies or not, we still don't know what those antibodies mean. Um, does it mean that you're immune from COVID and you can't get it again? Um, does it, if you are immune, how long does that immunity last? Does it last a month? Does it last a lifetime like measles uh, immunity does? Does it last, you know, a few months like the, the influenza virus uh, immunity does? Um, we still don't have any of those answers. And so the test shouldn't be used for any kind of decisions about can I visit my grandmother? Can I um, be a healthcare worker and not wear a mask? Um, can I, um, you know, take extra risks because I feel like I'm safe? We can't make any of those judgments in an educated way based on this test because we just still uh, need to know so much more about what those antibodies really mean. And then there was a second part of your question. Uh, the second part of the question was around systemic antibody testing. Did you? Yeah, that, okay. that was, I think it was a question about plasma. Um... Oh, are we giving antibody plasma treatment? Yes. So antibody plasma treatment is a research um, therapy. So it is being studied in some, um, uh, some hospitals as a research tool to see would this be beneficial to give to COVID patients who are sick in the hospital and um, basically taking antibodies from people who have recovered from COVID and uh, giving them in an intravenous infusion to people who are sick with COVID, could those antibodies help fight the virus? And it is being a drug that is being studied, a therapy that is being studied, but there's not enough evidence yet to know whether that really works or not. So the FDA has not approved it as a treatment. Uh, it's really a, a research uh, study that, that is currently being, being studied in some research centers. Great. So we realize this shelter in place is hard for everybody, but it's particularly hard, I think, for young people who, who sort of live their lives based on their social life and, and can't always understand why it is that we find ourselves in this position. So um, I have a, a list of questions here related to activities. Um, and some of them you've answered time and time again, but I think it's worth answering again because people are still asking. And I, I think it's important for us to realize that these things are, are of concern to them. So when will swimming pools be allowed to open? Why is lap swimming not allowed? Any hope of reprieve for summer activities, especially for kids? So as the weather's getting warmer, we're getting this question quite a lot. A lot of people want to get back to, to, to swimming, 
a recreational activity or back to their swim team. The state order does not allow swimming at this time. Um, uh, part of that reason is because even though um, the water itself, you know, a chlorinated pool uh, helps kill the virus, but uh, people congregate around pools, people breathe above the water in pools, people congregate in changing rooms. Um, and this, the local order is not allowed to be any, any looser than the state order. And so until the state um, moves uh, to the point where they're allowing swimming, um, the only swimming that really is allowed is in the setting of a daycare or summer camp for, um, for children. So, so we have uh, rules around how to safely operate a daycare setting or a camp with a stable group of 12 children or less, and a lot of activities uh, can happen within those 12. They can be in closer contact even though they're not from the same household. So the contact sports and swimming and, and other things can happen just in that child care setting, uh, but not for um, children who are in, in, in child care or a, or a day camp and not for adults at this time. So speaking of these groups of 12 children, um, summer camps can operate, but can activities like Cub Scout den meetings take place if it's 12 children or less in, operated in the same way as a camp? Cur currently, the, the order allows for day camps as a part of child care for workers who are, uh, you know, they're, they're an essential business and they're working in their essential business or another allowed business like an outdoor business or they're, they're working in their business from home. Um, and so it's really the, the letter and the intent of the order is for a, a child care activity. Um, so, uh, and, and, and it's really recommended that these be a stable group, um, ideally over at least a three or four week period. I know some families are used to having day camp, um, um, be in one day camp one week and another day camp another week, but we really encourage it to be a longer experience because the more the groups change, the more the opportunity there is for spread. So we're coming up on uh, 4.30. Can we keep you for about 10 more minutes? Sure. Will you give us another 10 minutes? That will allow us to get through all these questions, which I think people will yeah. very much appreciate. Um, so why can't we have small gatherings of 10 or less when other parts of the state allow it? That, that is something that the health officers across the Bay Area are discussing, and that's, um, you know, that, that's another step towards opening up our society. The initial shelter-in-place orders were really uh, uh, asking people to not mix um, within outside of their household. Um, but we realize how difficult it is, and, and, that's, and how hard that is, the need for social contact, and, you know, Doing it virtually only goes so far, and it's not not the same as as being in the same space. And so we're looking at ways to um, build into future orders the possibility for small groups uh, to get together, small stable groups outside of the household. It's not currently allowed now, um, but we're looking at that for for the future. When will schools go back to normal? So the state is actually currently working on some guidelines for schools, and they've been working very closely with our school leaders, our school uh, superintendents. Um, the health officers uh, have also uh, been working very closely with our schools. And so, um, so we're really uh, hopefully going to have some more clear guidance about um, school activities, uh, not only for the summer, but uh, hopefully to help us uh, get some planning for the fall. Uh, virtual learning is challenging. It's, it's really hard. It's hard on the teachers. It's hard on the, the students, and it's hard, hard on the parents who are trying to trying to adjust to their their children um, learning virtually. Um, so those guidelines are coming, and um, we'll hopefully have some more more details very soon. So this is an important one. High school football is it going to happen? That's a really challenging one because obviously. Football is a very much a contact sport. It involves a large number of players. Um, you can't social distance uh, and play tackle football. So, so those those are very challenging things. Um, we're looking at professional sports now, trying to figure out how to do this, you know, safely um, and uh, how, how to put on professional sporting events, maybe without.
crowds in the stadium um, and how to do that safely. So they're probably going to be learning a lot from the professionals on how they do that and, and maybe take some of those lessons learned and apply it to high school sports and, and other contact sports. Um, but um, you know, contact sports, uh, especially among large uh, groups like, like a football team, it, it is a very high risk activity. So, so uh, we have to think through that really carefully. Doubles tennis is another question you've addressed before, but we got that question again. Can people play doubles tennis? Not at this time. So, so the outdoor activities that we're allowing are based on the concept of, of activities that are not contact sports, that you can social distance with, um, that you're not using a lot of shared equipment. So you can play singles tennis, maybe you have two different colored balls, and one person touch one ball, the other person touch the other ball. Um, but uh, doubles tennis, when there's two people on the same side of the court, um, it's hard to stay six feet apart and still have a competitive game. Um, so, so we're really um, working on those concepts of, of activities you can do and maintain that social distance and not, not touch a lot of shared equipment. What about churches? That's obviously one we're hearing a lot about. Yeah, and the state just came out with guidelines around churches, just, just came out with that within the last couple of days. And so we're, we in the Bay Area are really looking at those guidelines and, and studying those, those guidelines. Um, and, and thinking about at what point we uh, can allow some more church activities. Right, right now, um, a lot of churches are meeting you know, virtually on Zoom or other platforms. Uh, we did put out a, a couple weeks ago a, a um, vehicle-based gathering ordinance that would allow some churches and other groups to, to gather in their vehicles. Um, but we realize that's not the same as, as getting together um, uh, in, in a church building or even gathering together outside um, outside of your vehicles but in the outside fresh air or a church gathering so we're going to be looking at that it's not currently allowed by the local borders but we, we do realize the, the, the desire for a lot of people to, to, to gather um, churches uh, unfortunately have been sites of a lot of outbreaks um, in California and throughout the uh, country so we have to do this carefully and thoughtfully um, because um, we don't want our churches to be places where uh, people get sick and um, you know spread the virus we want to do it in a safe manner so I want to remind everybody watching that our website at cchealth.org has an extensive FAQ list that really delineates what activities are or are not allowed so if we didn't get to your specific activity today I really want to encourage you to visit cchealth.org uh, and look for information there uh, about specific activities. There are a couple of other questions on here that I think are really worth spending a little time on. So um, we got the question, Is if there is a resurgence of cases by September, how quickly will you require non-essential businesses to close again? Um, it's, it's a good question, and it's, it's something we don't have a defined answer on yet. Um, we know that the action we took uh, quickly in, in March um, made a real difference in places uh, that didn't um, shut down as quickly they saw uh, tremendous surges the fact that we shut down you know right before st. Patrick's Day um, you know when a lot of people are used to going out and socializing may have made a big difference um, you know uh, places like New York that, that took another whole week to, to shut down um, saw tremendous surges. So we, we know sometimes if there is uh, a surge, acting quickly um, can make a difference. Uh, what we don't know is all these different um, uh, social distancing protocols that we're putting in, how much they are slowing uh, the spread. And so we're hopeful that uh, if we do see a surge, uh, it'll happen at a slower pace because um, we are um, practicing all these uh, different uh, social distancing and infection control techniques that we're just not used to um, before COVID came around. We weren't used to wearing face coverings in public everywhere we go. We were not used to staying six feet apart uh, from people outside of our household. So we hope those things um, will make whatever surge happens uh, come very slowly so we can react to it um, in, in, a, in a measured pace. But the thing about epidemics, 
is they tend to spread in an exponential uh, fashion. And so um, when the cases go down, they go down exponentially. And when they go up, they tend to go up exponentially. And, um, and we've seen that certainly um, throughout the world that uh, small numbers can quickly turn into to big numbers. So we, that's why we watch the numbers every day and really are, are prepared to take action if we see the numbers heading in the wrong direction. So there was a report on local media late last week about a doctor in our community who um, works at a local trauma center uh, reporting that there was an increased number of suicides and, and severe suicide attempts uh, coming in through their trauma center uh, since the shelter at home began. From a public health standpoint, doesn't that mean we should be focusing more on mental health aspects of shelter in place? We definitely should be looking at the impacts of shelter in place on, on mental health. Um, we have not seen a um, rise in suicide attempts, and we're having our um, behavioral health division look carefully at uh, all the data to see if there's any kind of increase in suicide attempts or other kind of concerning um, trends uh, 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 throughout the county. Um, we don't have any data to, to, to show that at this point, but it's something we're really concerned about. We're really looking at carefully. We know that it's it's been hard on a lot of people. Um, we know that the the economic downturn has um, led to a lot of people to lose their jobs, um, lose their income. That's that's an incredible um, stress that is placed on families, um, and we know know that's been really hard on on people. Um, and People are missing a lot of those important social connections that, that are really important for their mental well-being. So we're really looking at all those things, and that's why we want to open up um, the society. We want to open up the economy, but we also want to do it carefully and safely um, because we also want to um, protect lives, and we don't want to trigger a surge that's going to lead to another shutdown. So we, we want to remind everybody that 211 is a really great resource for anybody who feels like they need help. They can connect you with all kinds of resources that are out there. So we really encourage anybody who might be having any, any thoughts or any, any struggles uh, to call 911 or to call 211. Uh, they can help uh, put you in touch with whatever resources you need. The other side of it is the unintended health issues that, cause, that come from being uh, sheltered in place. People might not be seeking care for heart attacks, drug, drug overdoses, suicides. Um, are we tracking these? Yeah, we are. <clears throat> we are looking at those. We're looking at our ambulance volumes. We're looking at our hospital volumes. We're looking at, you know, quality outcomes as far as, um, you know, people getting their mammograms. Uh, kids coming in for their immunizations. Uh, there is, you know, some reports uh, showing that across California, uh, a lot of kids have um, uh, taken a pause on getting some of their vac vaccinations and delayed getting them some of their vaccinations for a lot of those childhood illnesses. And so, so that's a concern. And, um, you know, initially when, when the outbreak uh, really began and we began the shelter in place. Um, a lot of hospitals and medical clinics stopped um, doing routine care or moved to virtual care um, uh, in order because they didn't have enough personal protective equipment and they needed to, to um, be prepared for a, a potential surge that was very uh, likely heading our way at that point. Now that, that we've been able to flatten the curve and we've been able to improve our um, mask and gown and, and glove supply, um, and we are now seeing those facilities open up, reach out to their patients, encourage patients to come back for their routine health care, encourage kids to come in for their vaccinations, uh, the women to come in for their pap smears and mammograms, uh, people to come in for their blood pressure checks and diabetes checks, all that kind of routine care. We don't want people to put that off for too long. Hospitals and medical clinics and, and doctor's offices have also really transformed how they operate. So they're, they're screening people when they arrive. They've got extra hand sanitizer stations. They've got waiting rooms where people are, are spaced six feet apart. Uh, some people, some offices have people wait in their cars until their appointment time, and then they're called in from their car, so they don't even have to stay in the waiting room. So, so our, our Medical and dental clinics and uh, hospitals have really transformed themselves to make them 
safe places for people to come get care uh, during this uh, pandemic. And so really encourage people to, to get the, your needed medical care and, and, and don't put things off any longer. So I think people are wanting more detailed information about the suicide indicators that we talked about. So I will say that we have a, um, a graph that we got from the coroner's office that tracks suicides for the past 12 months. And we will post that in the comments here when this is done. We can sort of see one suicide is one suicide too many. Every one of us thinks that. Um, but we'll, the trend, uh, I think, is obvious in this, in the graph that we're happy to provide. And then as we're able to sort of uh, collect more information about what the, the doctor in the community was talking about, we'll make that available to the public as well. Because I think, I, again, all of us feel the weight of it, um, but, but it's something that we're looking at closely. Um, and, and I think that's, that's information worth sharing. So we'll come, we'll come back to everybody uh, with that information. Um, that's really all of the, the major kind of categories of questions that we got today. So I thank you for taking even more than the half an hour you had allotted to us uh, to be here today, Dr. Farnatano. wanted to remind everybody as well that the video will be here on Facebook uh, for you to watch anytime or as many times as you like. Um, and then we will find some time with Dr. Farnatano to do this again next week. So we thank you for your comments and your, and your questions, um, and we appreciate you participating, and we will see you again next week. Thank you very much.